my background is a little is a little bit uh, checkered and and convoluted. But I, I started off in um, in English as an academic, so I got my, my PhD at Berkeley. Then, in a uh, momentary lapse of sanity, I, I came back to Berkeley to get a law degree, um, which w- was interesting sociologically, and I, I have used in, in some contexts academically. And part of my focus has, I mean, it's quite wide ranging, but I have worked in in some degree um, on science fiction, um, but also particularly on American transcendentalists and representations of nature um, and pantheism in the 19th century. And that in unexpected and somewhat circuitous ways led me to become interested in corporations. Uh, the corporation seeming to be the exact opposite of, of nature mm-hmm. as something completely artificial, uh, something representing technological society, um, which to some extent is true, but what also became disturbing to me were the similarities and confluences between representations of nature and the corporation. And eventually that led to a, a much longer project about the cultural significance or ontology of the corporation, how it's represented as a person or something that thinks or has a soul, which is connected to artificial intelligence. And and a lot of the texts that I'm interested in seem to pose this opposition between nature and corporation as if the corporation were, were something evil that was usurping nature. But in disturbing ways, nature itself might have turned out to be virtual or artificial um, or not exactly what it seems. Nature and corporations have, have a lot of similar attributes, uh, mm. perhaps surprisingly. And, and one, one issue that gets contested is, uh, does nature have a personality or a soul? Does it have agency or intention? Uh, and can it speak mm-hmm. uh, in some way to us, in some way that we might not be able to understand? Uh, there's, of course, a great deal of overlap with the way that we conceive of divinity um, as well, as this gigantic mass that is much larger than us, um, that we might merge into, but that might communicate with us. Um, so a, a lot of discourse and debate about uh, whether corporations can speak, um, mm-hmm. whether money is speech, uh, what kind of speech rights corporations have, whether corporations are people, um, which is, of course, an absurd notion, uh, whether they have agency um, or intention. Uh, how do we know what's natural? How do we know that we're real and not artificial? How do we know that we're not artificial constructs as so many, you know, an endless number of films and TV shows? There's a broad continuum. Some of these ideas aren't necessarily science fiction ideas. They go back to Plato. How do we know we're not in a cave looking at shadows? Um, and they get represented in science fiction contexts um, in interesting ways. But they're really um, questions about the nature of identity. Um, and the nature of reality. Mm -hmm. And the the film Avatar raises this question of second nature or or the imitation of life in a way, again, that that I think locates a lot of anxiety about corporations. The corporation is, is in a way, the ultimate form of artificial or collective intelligence. And um, in a way, what Avatar is suggesting, not sure it's in control of of the matter or or, or where its intentions are, but um, it's suggesting that I think for most people, it's just a fantasy about nature, uh, about returning to nature, to this primitive nature. But but in reality, it's about digital aboriginals, mm-hmm. and and it's 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 a concept you can find in in uh, throughout Western culture and particularly American culture. Um, it's a fantasy of a prelapsarian existence, an existence before we ruined nature, before we became people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's really about going back to an animal existence before consciousness um, in some way. The, the irony uh, of Avatar, of course, is that you can only do it through technology. And one of the premises is we've destroyed nature on Earth, and so we need to go out there, uh, mm-hmm. always to the future or always to the past in these narratives. And that's the premise of, of, uh, of Avatar as well. Humans can't go back to nature. Literally, you can't breathe the air. It's poisonous to you. Mm-hmm. So not only have we destroyed nature here, if we try to go out there, either in space and forward in time or back in time, as in Dances with Wolves, uh, you can't. This idea that nature, uh, that civilization has corrupted us and we need to go back to nature. But their fantasies about having lost some primitive existence that's far superior to a corporate existence or a technological existence, always brought to you, of course, by the corporation. Mm. Uh, this has always been the case in American culture. Uh, I think really starting in the 60s, especially where it's distilled, so you get the Flintstones being paired with uh, the Jetsons. It's this kind of fantasy of a primitive, going back to a primitive existence that's 
superior to our existence being paired with some future um, mm. uh, existence. And that's what happens in Avatar. It's both the future and the present. The, the ultimate, to me, horrifying thing about Avatar is it's a corporate entertainment um, about virtual reality. Um, the, the Navi and Pandora very explicitly in the film only exist as a virtual reality. Mm -hmm. They only exist on, on the cloud. You literally have to get into a space suit and download yourself into, uh, you know, to being an avatar, mm -hmm. because if you try to interact with nature anymore, it will kill you. Um, and so as in many of these other narratives, the, the way that you go back to nature is through a corporate nature is through second nature is uploading yourself into the cloud. One of the ulterior motives of the corporation is to displace humanity itself to get rid of humanity, um, not only to harness it and to get rid of labor and to displace people but or enslave people in, in some of these fantasies. And of course, some of them are metaphors. They're, they're not literal. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately also to steal people's souls because corporations don't have souls. Mm -hmm. um, but now they're, they're alleged to have a soul. The other line of thought that's quite interesting in many of these films mm -hmm. is... Um, very disturbing and interesting representations of motherhood and human reproduction. Because what the corporation also does is to not only displace people, but uh, disrupt natural reproduction and make it artificial reproduction. In all of these corporate movies where there's corporate malfeasance, whether it's the Tyrell Corporation in Blade Runner or the corporation in the Resident Evil series where there's cloning, it's different versions of taking over the process of reproduction to get rid of reproduction entirely mm -hmm. so that the corporation can simply clone you um, or uh, download you virtually in some way and, and reproduce you that way and take over the process of, mm -hmm. of natural reproduction, um, which is, of course, extremely disturbing. Um, and, you know, and, it, and it's, of course, cast against Mother Nature. And, and the language itself is very telling, right? You, you, even the, the legal discourse about corporations, you hear about a parent corporation. Mm -hmm. You hear about merging corporations, which is very much a kind of science fiction term. You, eventually, you, you effectively merge your body into this suit. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's a term that you get a lot in descriptions of nature, and you merge into this greater consciousness. Mm -hmm. But all of those things could, could describe nature on the one hand as positive, also describe the corporation as a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, so the flip sides of, of one another. There's uh, a novel by Richard Powers called um, The Overstory. Uh, and Powers, uh, again, you know, whether he's a science fiction novel or, or not is debatable and it's moot in some way. But The Overstory is fascinating because it's partly an environmentalist novel. It's about trees as giant ecosystems and gigantic collective ecosystems and collective forms of consciousness. Um, and the descriptions of consciousness in, in the book are fascinating because there's so much more sophisticated versions of what's going on in Avatar. In Avatar, you're, mm -hmm. you're told in a variety of ways that you download information by, or the Navi don download information by plugging themselves into, again, their, their USB cords through yeah. their hair braids. So they're, but it's, it's a world wide web, but of nature. Um, except it's really, you know, it's their way of saying this is all CGI, this is fake nature, this is just a computer, this is a web, this is how we exchange nature. Mm -hmm. But of course, nature is kind of a web like that too. Part of Power's point in um, the Overstory is that the trees are underground networks. They the roots actually con connect with each other. You can't tell what's a single organism and what's a collective organism uh, in nature or with trees. They communicate to each other electrochemically. They communicate each other in a way with a kind of quantum spooky distance that I, I suppose scientists still don't quite understand across mm. distances where there seems to be no direct physical way of communication that might be happening. On the other hand, what's fascinating about the overstory, uh, which is also a pun on, on the oversoul, which is, nature, which is uh, Emerson's notion for nature as a collective consciousness. It's an animistic principle, the mm. idea that everything is alive, everything has a soul or consciousness. What if there are forms of consciousness we don't understand because they're speaking in ways we don't understand? What if what would it mean for a rock to speak? The other part of Powers, uh, the Overstory, which also has a dark title in addition to the Emerson reference, which is the story is over. It's already too late. Um, so Overstory means you know both canopy of trees, the overarching story we're not see, and also eschatology, apocalypse. It's all too late. Mm. Uh, 
the other central part that balances the overstory, though it's focused on one person, of course, you have to give a human face to, to the corporation, mm -hmm. but it's a person who has a motive to create a virtual reality in a way to escape from the limitations of his body. Uh, and again, corporation itself, the term corporation means body. That's literally what it means. It's, you know, corpse, but also army corps, marine corps, mm. um, and so forth. And that's why very tellingly in many of these horror films about corporations, um, uh, resident evil and, and, and aliens and so forth, you can't really tell the difference between the corporation and the army. They are one thing. But so the other part of this corporation in, in um, the overstory is, this person is constructing a new, he starts off constructing a new type of video game, but what he gradually realizes is he can construct a mirror image of the entire world. This person is creating a virtual world and becomes more and more immersed in it. And the teleolo teleology of it is, again, it's a zero-sum game. Just as corporations accrete rights and personhood and soul and wealth, from individuals, they are parasites sucking it away from people. Yeah. People get less and less rights. People become disenfranchised. People become effectively enslaved. People become automatons. People wind up in these giant vats. The, I think, terrifying premise of the overstory is it's a zero-sum game. The more we invest in and the more we develop these artificial worlds and second nature and virtual reality, the more the real world disappears. Mm -hmm. That's true in some ways in our social life. It's true ontologically in the way we think of ourselves and the, and the way we live. As the virtual world grows, nature disappears. It's almost as if you have to tear down the, you know, cut down the trees and destroy the planet in some way mm -hmm. to feed into the virtual reality that's growing. As the virtual world takes shape, the real world becomes less ethereal. It gets dematerialized. It's being sucked into the second nature. It's being sucked into this alternate world. I think that there's that that's why there's so much anxiety focused on corporations in so many of these movies, and and why they are you know literally or figuratively often um, they're they're kind of like horror uh, movie villains. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're always up to no good out there. What seem like remnants of people are in fact themselves just constructs of the corporation. If you think of a lot of these films, there is a an extreme hostility and antagonism between the corporation. Uh, and and people, but if you look at it from um, you know certain economic theories, if the corporation's normal modus, if it's if it's normal drive, and again mm -hmm. this is anthropomorphized, it's created to do that. It's created by charter to immunize people from liability, to take people out of the picture, uh, and to give over to the fantasy, the construct of the corporation. The corporation has a tendency towards monopoly. The corporation doesn't want competition. The corporation is not actually capitalistic. It doesn't, you know, it may thrive on it. We may want that. But that means you need regulation and social control and government and, and oversight. Yeah. Um, what the corporation wants is no government. And in fact, the corporation has really, I think, displaced the, the government and, and every other institution as the foremost institution in the world. Mm -hmm. And the advertising is the foremost form of communication in the world. Mm. Um, you know, that's obvious if you think, you know, for most people, more people will have seen an advertising jingle um, than have seen a Shakespeare play or read a Shakespeare play. And corporations tend not just towards monopoly um, in a literal and figurative sense. I think they tend toward eliminating workers. They, they want to reduce the workforce as much as possible. They want to maximize profits. And if there's a way to maximize profits by harvesting people's organs or by killing people or, or whatever, a corporation mm -hmm. will do that. A corporation is beyond good and evil. Yeah. Um, a corporation just exists with a kind of drive. And again, in certain kinds of films and in certain kinds of representation, that makes it a force of nature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are there are these notions that nature is benign and new age theories of nature uh, and mother nature and, and so forth. Um, I, you know, I, I would say just as a personal aside, I'm very much an environmentalist, but I'm very wary and resistant to these anthropomorphic notions of nature because nature is always a social construct. Mm -hmm. To think yeah. that we can know nature or that there even is such a thing as nature other than as a regulatory mechanism is to fall back into this kind of prelapsarian, fall, Edenic thinking mm -hmm. that nature exists out there in a way that we are part of. Um, as soon as we had language, as soon as we had good and evil, um, however you want to see that, we are no longer part of nature in that sense. Mm -hmm. We're biological organisms, we're dependent on nature, and so on. Um, 
but um, the corporation is like nature in the sense that it is a blind, you know, in some ways it's a blind mechanism that doesn't know good or evil. It just exists to perpetuate itself. It exists to increase its profit. It is, in many ways, like the you know, like a virus. Um, it right. just wants to propagate itself uh, at any expense. And like a virus, sure, it would be great if it keeps its host alive in order to propagate. But it couldn't care less about the host. Thank you so much for inviting me, and take care. Mm-hmm.